So, um, today I want to start going from the sort of uh, Torah case we've been discussing uh, for the most part to the case of a billion varieties, and then pretty soon we'll go to modular curves. So let's start with some basic definitions. So what are the objects? So the objects we'll start with will be elliptic curves. Is this light also? No, it's not a light. An elliptic curve E over some field K. And so one way to define it is it's a one-dimensional curve connected projective uh, smooth algebraic group. <coughs> over K. So um, there's sort of lots of ways to think about these things. So what's a more sort of uh, classical way to think about it? So the characteristic of K is not uh, two or three. I'm just saying characteristic is zero. I'm not going to be dealing with finite characteristic at least anytime soon. What you can do is you can write a cubic equation for E. So in projective coordinates, you can write E as y squared z equals 4x cubed minus axz minus b. Thought of as a sub variety or sub scheme, whatever you prefer, of two dimensional projective space. Okay, so normally the, the z is emitted and you have y squared equals 4x cubed minus ax. Sorry, minus bz cubed minus a. Z squared. Z squared. Z squared here and Z cubed here. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. I think it's homogeneous now. Is that right? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so if you look at the chart where Z equals one, then you get uh, f fine space. You get the usual equation, and this compactifies it by adding the point in the plane. And what you need for this to be smooth is you need uh, a cubed. Minus 27b squared, not to equal zero. If this equals zero, then you have one singular point. Get to p1 the singular point. Okay. Okay. So associated to e, you can define a chain variant, which uh, if you pick the coordinates to be this, is 1728 a squared a. Uh, uh, a cubed, sorry, divided by a cubed minus 27 squared. Um, and so if your field is algebraically closed, sort of uh, J of E determines E. Okay, so you can think of this E as being parameterized by P1, given by J. And then if K is, is not algebraically closed, then you have sort of quadratic and cubic and sexy twist, depending on what E is and stuff. All right. Um, that's one way to think about them through this explicit equation. So now let's deal with the case of the complex numbers a bit. So if K is the complex numbers, then it turns out that you can write EFC, complex points, I see mod lambda for lambdas and lattice. So lambda is isomorphic to z squared with the lattice in C. So let me just recall how that's done. Okay, how do you do it? So first of all, what you do is you state, for example, by Riemann Rock. And if you don't know Riemann Rock, that's fine. But if you work out the Riemann Rock theorem for the elliptic curve, what you get is that 
the dimension, complex dimension of the cotangent bundle is equal to 1, which basically means that E has a global differential form and non zero. differential form uh, omega and because um, and, and unique up to scale and so because you have to scale then omega is also uh, which is translation invariant has to be invariant in translation So once you have this differential form, what you do is you can define a map from the, uh, sorry, from the homology of E, the integral homology, to the complex numbers, which takes a cycle and sends it to the integral of omega on that cycle. Okay? And let's give it some names. F. So then, um, if the image of F were contained in a real line, so if the image wasn't a lattice, um, then what you could do is you could sort of scale omega by a complex number to make that real line the real numbers. So then, um, uh, then uh, wall log, you can assume that uh, the image of f is contained inside the, sorry, the imaginary numbers, so i times the real numbers, inside c. And that's a contradiction because then if you look at um, the function, which is you integrate to z omega, you take the real part, this is a global function now, because if you go along a cycle, it seems by an imaginary number, so it doesn't change the real part. So then this is a global harmonic function. And that's bad, because by the maximum principle, it has to be constant. Okay? So I list the maximum principle. This argument was like my favorite part of all undergrad. So I wanted to talk about it. Um, okay, so then once you have this, you can define lambda to be the image of f. And then you have a map to c mod lambda, which again takes z and sends it to the integral from 0 to z of omega. That was well defined because it modeled out the lambda. So then because w or because omega is translation invariant, this is a group homomorphism. Um, so it's gotta be surjective because there's no closed subgroups of this. And you can show it's injective without much trouble. In the sense of being an isomorphism. Alright. So this is what all complex curves complex liquid curves look like. And this is how you can parameterize complex vector curves now by these lattices, which themselves are parameterized by H modulus to Z, and that's sort of where the margins of curve theory begins. So we'll get to that, but that's not our focus today. 
one thing you sort of uh, get out of this analysis is that if you look at the turning points of EFC, then they're isomorphic to Q minus Z squared, which is a torsion of the Q minus lambda squared, right? So we get sort of a, a tan torsion point. Okay, and so now we can define inside E to the N, we can define Turing cosets. So if you look at um, T plus B, then this is a torsion coset in, in E to the N. If, so first of all, T is a torsion point, T is a torsion point. And B in E to the N is an algebraic subgroup. It's a connected algebraic subgroup. Which in this case just means that B is isogenous to a power of E is sitting somehow inside E to the N. Okay? But it's sort of a very analogous definition to what we had in the Torres case. And now instead of sort of sub we have these sub algebraic subgroups. Questions about any of this? All right. So now we get to here we're going to move over the next couple of classes. Called Money Mumford. Money Mumford conjecture. It's a theorem. So I guess it's their conjecture. First proven by Renan. Which I'm going to state in a similar way to the stated next conjecture. So if you have a, a sub variety, V and E to the N, with an algebraic sub variety. Then V contains finitely many <coughs> maximal torsion cosets. Okay. So now, like I said before, we can rephrase this in various ways. So, for example, the union of the finitely many maximal torsion cosets will be the risky closure of all the torsion points in E, because sort of torsion points are clearly dense topologically and also the risky inside these torsion cosets. Okay. So like this implies that if E is a curve, it contains only five the main torsion points, unless it itself is a translator of an elliptic curve by a torsion point. All right, so having phrased it in this way, there's actually no reason to restrict to um, elliptic curves. So uh, we can say this in the more general context of a BDM varieties. So let's define what those are. So those are sort of this is easy to define, but they're a little more complicated to deal with explicitly in that no one does. So in a BDM variety, is just like before, a sort of a connected, smooth, projective, algebraic group over K of some dimension. So now the problem is that uh, in elliptic curves have sort of nice cubic equation, the BN varieties, we don't have equations for it. We have something, but the yeah, answer is useful for most things. So, you know, a priori it's not clear any of these exist besides just the parts of elliptic curves or something. But they do. So now it turns out this is not very much rock, but it's also true. So if, uh, if we write that dimension A is G, then A has a G 
linearly independent um, translation invariant differential forms. Then once again, you can define a map, this time to C to the G, which sends gamma to the integral of all G, differential forms, log H1, log a loop. Uh, but so by a similar argument, you can show the image here is also less inside C of the G. Uh, the point being that this is sort of well-defined only up to an action of G or G of C, because you can just pick a different basis of linear, of differential forms. Then if this is contained inside a co-dimension one real subspace, you can make that the imaginary bar of some coordinate and then do the same trick way before you get a contradiction. So you get a contradiction. Okay, so if you let lambda be the image of F, then complex points of C are isomorphic to C to the G mod lambda. And now once you have this, differential forms from this perspective are sort of obvious. They're just BZ1, BZ2, BZ3, and so forth. So all of those exist, uh, even after you quote now by a lattice, because we're all inflation invariant. Okay? Okay, the average medium variety um, is isomorphic to some complex stores. Um, it's sort of determined by its complex structure, but it's not true that every complex uh, torus gives you an abelian variety except for dimension one. Okay? Um, sort of the, the, the obstruction essentially, or exactly, is that if you look at a random quotient like this, you get a compact complex manifold, but it might not have any global meromorphic function, for example. Uh, so if, if you do have enough meromorphic functions, then you get, in fact, an algebraic variety. Okay, so then uh, I can basically do this. Has only I can just replace this by this case. All right. So that's the version of money more will actually deal with. Okay. But yeah, if you want to make any of our arguments sort of explicit or anything down concretely, you can replace a by e to the n. Things should become a little more understandable in that context. All right. Um, I want to give an example of the kind of thing Martin and Mumford can show. So this is actually the original example which motivated it. So we're going to take C to be a, sorry, a genus G uh, complex curve. Okay, I'll read my surface if you want forever. So when I say curve, I mean smooth and compact and everything. Okay. And then we can, uh, one of the most potent sources for getting abelian varieties is we can take Jacobians. So we take J to be the Jacobian of C, which ends up being a G-dimensional abelian variety. Let me give a, a brief description, a reminder of what one way to think of the Jacobian. So the Jacobian makes sense of arbitrary fields, but over s and, and, and generally what you can do is you can think of J as a, so in this case I guess J of C, you can think of as degree zero line bundles on C. And so what does that mean concretely? 
So first we can define the group of divisors, div C on C. And this is just formal integer sums of points. So this is like guys of the form sum of AI, PI. Where the AI are integers and the PI are points in C. Okay. Then given a divisor, it has a degree. And so we set the zero to be degree zero divisors. So the kernel of this map Z, where this map sends the sum of AI PI to just the sum of AI. Just add up all the coefficients. That gives you a map. So this is degree zero divider. Now, if you let M of C be the field of rational functions on C, global meromorphic functions, then there's a map from M of C to the zero of C, which just takes a function, and every point you record the order of vanishing of this function. This is a sum over all points, but really only finitely many terms are not zero. So if you have a zero, you record the order of the zero. If you get a pole, you record the minus order of the pole. And the co-kernel of this map is exactly the Jacobian. So this is exact. Okay. This is one way to think of the of the Jacobian. So in fact, you can actually use this to give an algebraic construction of J, because you can show that all you need are the sum of G points minus the difference of G points. Okay, so in that way, you can somehow construct J as you take a product of a bunch of C's, and you know a bunch of operations on them, you sort of contract it down to an abelian variety. Okay, so that's what J is. And now if you fix a point zero on your curve, you end up getting an embedding from your curve to the Jacobian, which takes the point P and maps it to P minus P zero. Okay. And if the genus G is bigger than or equal to one, then phi is an embedding. And if G actually equals one, this is nice and one fit. So I'll the curve is already its own Jacobian. It is P minus zero or the class P minus zero? Sorry, the class of P minus P zero. Yeah. I probably not gonna write square brackets every time, but yeah, I always think the class of P minus P zero. Okay, so now uh, if we apply Martin Mumford, so if G is at least 2, then C is not an elliptic curve, so it can't be a, a torsion coset of J. It's not metamorphic of elliptic curve. So if G is at least 2, Martin Mumford says that phi of C. contains finitely many torsion points. Right? So by E, uh, there's finitely many P 
such that mp minus mp0, such that the class of this is equal to 0, which means what? It means that up to scale and taking uh, rational powers, There are finitely many rational functions on C with exactly one zero and one pole which is at P zero. Okay? If you want functions with only poles at P zero and it have exactly one zero. There's only finitely many of those. Except for you can also scale by complex numbers, and once you have one half, you can of course take powers of that half. Okay? Okay, this is like a classical curve statement exactly implied in my launcher. Uh, you can actually do a little bit better. Go a little further with this analysis. So what you can do is you can define V to be sort of this variety minus this variety, so every point here minus every point here, the image of that would be some other variety inside J. Okay. Is it clear what would I mean when I write this? I mean sort of the image from Vc cross Vc to J of AB equals to A minus A. Okay. And if you if you look at what this is, this is exactly the collection of points P1 minus P2. Or P1 and P2 are inside the curve. Now, the genus is two of them, this is just everything. Just by sort of dimension count, connectedness and properness, it has to be everything. So now, if we restrict to G is greater than two. And so then you want to apply Mullen Mumford to V, and so then the question is does V contain any torsion cosets or something, things like yeah. that? So, it turns out um, uh, there's two possibilities. So, one of two things occur. So the first possibility is that um, C uh, fits into the following diagram. So you have C degree 2 cover of an elliptic curve. And it's also hyperelliptic, it's a degree 2 cover of P1. And there's some map here of degree 2, such that this square commutes. So if C fits into uh, a thing like this, then you can find an elliptic curve inside V by sending, so if you call this map uh, C, so then uh, if you look at the map E goes to sort of the sum of the two points above E, which are like C inverse E, divided by C inverse E. So then this gives you a map from div E to div C, just by extending linearly, which extends to a map from div 0 E to div 0 C. And it turns out the image of this will lie inside V. So in this case, you have an elliptic curve inside E. So one, one concrete example of this So, a sort of 
general example is C is the projective vice closure of y squared equals R of Q of X, where R is cubic and Q is quadratic as polynomials. So this gives you a, a genus 3 curve. And then E is the curve y squared equals R of X. Again, the projective closure of this. And there's a map here which sends xy to q of xy. Okay. And so then this is the case I'm talking about here. So in this case, you will have torsion points inside v stemming from the torsion points in E with this map. Right. So the first thing that can happen, in which case g of c is equal to 3. This first case, like, implies genus is 3. And the second thing that happens, if genus is not 3, then v does not have any positive dimensional torsion cosets, so it has finitely many torsion points. Which means that, again, up to scaling and rational powers, there are finitely many rational functions with one zero and one pole. But this time, they can both move. Okay? And genus four and above, there's finitely many functions with one zero and one pole on a curve. All right. These are the kinds of statements you can get from Martin Mumford, of course, somehow it's still a simple case. But it somehow it demonstrates there's a big sort of industry of both like trying to prove these kind of statements and also analyzing when you do have torsion cosines inside in terms of some sort of geometric criterion like this. Okay. Jacob? Yes. So the that like algebra point is also like defined over like, a number field, right? You take like a, a like if you take some point, so are there mm -hmm. like even without like more than line, but you can just that like can you use it to apply to rational concepts? Like this kind of study? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's I mean something we're not going to do in this course, but and which is harder <laughs> is I mean the faulting theorem of course, and there's right. sort of the general that you know the big faulting theorem. So the small faulting theorem is that C over a number field of use is two as finitely many rational points. The big faulting theorem applies to any subvariety of any abelian variety. And it says that all of the storing points are contained inside transits of abelian subvarieties. So, um, yeah, you can do the exact same analysis that um, I did here and understand when there's finitely many torsion points on the set. And what that ends up amounting to is a statement like so, for example, so faulting, so Bordell tells you when your C has. Finitely many rational points, which means it leads to. Then you can ask when does C have finitely many points of degree at most two, for example. Not over a fixed field, but over any degree two extension of Q. Um, and so, of course, if C is a double cover to P1, then that's true. And you can use this kind of analysis to show that if C doesn't have a double cover to P1, then that's not true. And then similarly, you can sort of ask for degree three points, various other complicated configurations. And the way you do all that is you make sort of auxiliary subvarieties inside J, and you ask the question of when those contain million subvarieties, and you translate them to sort of elliptic curve from diagram like this. So yeah, there's. I think that answered your, your question. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, there are there are results like this. Um, there's actually a fairly recent result by Jennifer Park, if you want, who deals with sort of second symmetric powers in the Schopenhauer method, and doing exactly things like that. All right. Other questions? Okay, so what I want to do today, if you have time, is I want to talk about the reduction of Mann and Mumford to Q bar. So I promised you earlier, but having delivered the reduction 
of um, one meter matches any conjecture, Q bar. And so I realized that I, I should start off doing some other stuff first. But we'll get back to that later, maybe. Um, but I want to explain how, say, with Money Mumford, you, you, can, um, you can reduce to your feet of variety being defined um, over Q bar. OK? Um, all right, so to do that, we first need some sort of elementary statements. So let sigma be the set of torsion cosets of R mod Z to the n, just the n dimensional torus, just thought of as a D group now. There's no algebraic structure involved. Okay? So what I mean by this is just sort of torsion cosets, <coughs> torsion translates, torsion point translates. of closed subgroups. Of uh, connected closed subgroups. Okay. So note that um, it's a little tricky. So if you look in the billion variety, that's uh, C to the power of G mod some lattice. And so not every closed Lee subgroup ends up having a complex structure. That's something you have to be a little careful of. Nonetheless, all the Wiener subvarieties are of this form. So we'll just study everything of this form and then later worry about complex structure. Okay. And then let F sigma be finite unions of um, torsion cosets. Okay. So these are each collection of sets, of subsets of R mod Z to the N. Okay, so um, so I want just some basic uh, properties of, of F sigma. So first of all, uh, F sigma is closed under intersections. And second B for F sigma. And second of all, F sigma is um, no theory. Which means that if you have a, uh, a descending sequence of elements in F sigma, then this eventually stabilizes. Okay? An equivalent way of saying the second part which we're going to use, is that for any uh, subset, there is a minimal element of F sigma which contains that subset. Okay? Because otherwise, if you have a bunch, you can make a descending sequence because we're closed under intersection, and that sequence must stabilize, that must be the minimal element. This is just something about the structure of, of torsion process. So, um, proof. So, first of all, if you look at the union of a bunch of torsion cosets, intersect the union of other torsion cosets, what you get is the union of the intersections. So, therefore, we can reduce to the case where. A and B are each individual torsion cosets. Reduce, reduce to A, B, and sigma instead of just F sigma. So 
what you're really showing is like there's a topology, like you, these Cartesian sets are like your clothes, and, and if it's, it's an inferior topology. Yeah, that's right. You could phrase it in terms of like a, I think it's a risky topology or something like that. Um, okay, and now um, if A and B are actually torsion cosets, so write it as T plus G1, B equals, uh, so T1 plus G1, B equals T2 plus G2, then if the intersection is non empty, we can take. T1 equals T2 to be any torsion point inside the intersection. And then they're both inside. So you can write this as T plus G1 and T plus G2. And then A intersect B is T plus G1 intersect G2. Okay. Now G1 intersect G2 is a closed subgroup. And so you're done. So you get T plus a close. That's part one. Okay. Um, now part two is sort of a, a fairly standard argument in this context. I've seen before if you haven't taken something used to. So what you do is you do um, reduction on the number of components of highest dimension. In other words, what you do is you do a map from F sigma to uh, Z plus, Z bigger than or equal to zero to the N. Oh, this map something, I don't know, phi where phi A, uh, the i-th coordinate of phi A is the number of i-dimensional components of A. Okay? So if it's just points, you get a bunch of zeros and a number of points. If you get like one, one of those and a few other points, and that, and so on. Is this clear? I think some confused. So then, um, if B is contained in A and not equal to A, then phi of B is less than phi of A under the lexicographic order. Right? Because B is less than A, which means there's something in A which is not in B. Like the high dimensional guy in A that broke apart, then that coordinate went down. And the rest went up arbitrarily, but still the case. Okay, now, lexicographic ordering has the final descent property. So if you keep descending, you eventually stabilize it. Okay. All right. Okay, then just some basic stuff about. Um, about F sigma. Okay, now to the reduction. So let A over C be an abelian variety, and V and A be a subright. Be an algebraic set, right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to spread this out um, to a family of a billion varieties instead of just following. What we do is we say, well, okay, so A is over C, but it's really defined using finitely many equations. 
So you only define the many elements of C that define it. And you find the many elements that define V as well. So really, uh, we can define A and V over a finitely generated subfield K inside C. Okay? If you have the curve, for example, it's only got like what? Two coefficients. You can join those coefficients to Q and get a finely generated subfield of C. Okay, so finally generated uh, K over C, so it's finally generated over Q. Okay, so K might be inside Q bar already, it might be a number field, in which case we're done, or it's not a number field, so it's got some finite transcendence degree. So what does it mean? It means we can write K as the function field of a variety S over little k, where k inside q bar is a number field. Okay? This is just by no short normalization, basically. It's a finite extent of a pure number. Guy open is a finite cut of P2, and we can do that. And we only care about it being the function field of S, so we can remove like all singular points of S and everything, and assume that S is a nice smooth, smooth guy. The both matter for us, but in general, you can't do this kind of trick. Okay? So the K is the function field of S. So now if we write the coefficients defining A and V, they're going to make sense if you specialize them to a generic point of S. So by shrinking... S further, so removing some closed subsets of S, we can find a family of abelian varieties, script A over S, a abelian variety over S, or if you want a family of abelian varieties. A over S, and then a subvariety V in A, such that the pair AV, if you just look at it over the function field K, then you recover your original A and V. Okay. The, the way, one concrete way to, to think about this, I'm not going to think too much more about it, is that if A was the stick of A and V defined over Q and joint T, Right, so coefficients are rational functions in some auxiliary variable t. Then away from where those functions have poles, so if you remove finally many points of p1, you can actually specialize t, and you get a concrete sort of like, being right and sub right. And so this is what's happening here. So you're removing all the poles that show up, and you get this sort of family. Yeah. Maybe there's more parameters instead of the fibers that are non-singular, or we don't get a um, sorry, why would you, so... But is it family of variety, so yeah, is it like a... Oh, oh, scheme sorry, go ahead. Is a family of variety supposed to be a group scheme or it doesn't matter? Yes, it's going to end up being a group scheme. Um, so, so, so yes, you're right, you're going to, um, ah, non-singular. So, right, so the way you actually do this is you, is you want both the variety to make sense and for the group law to also make sense. And so once you remove those bad points and the group law makes sense, then you're non-singular automatically. Yeah. But yeah, you can also remove guys and make it non-singular. It's basically any property you want. You can refer to open subset and get it. Okay. Alright. Um, I'll go, I'll go maybe five minutes over today. Take this argument. Okay, so let the T1, sorry, let me make it capital T's, because they're Torvin goal sets. 
let these guys be the uh, maximum torsion cosets. In the okay. Okay. Now, um, torsion cost. Sorry, in in the uh, in V. Yes, that's right. Okay. So um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take sort of. Let me make it. This is my best scripty. Just have like a ears. So that these guys, what you get is um, because torsion cosets are sort of spread out, they're defined over the whole family at once. What you get are sort of a family of torsion cosets inside V over S. Okay, which are going to be inside inside of this V. So the idea is you had a bunch of torsion cosets over the generic point in V. Now you spread out to a family, and I can re-specialize to any point over Q bar. And now for Q bar, we have money Mumford. Okay? So now for each Q, and that's with Q bar, this sort of Ti sub Q are contained in finitely many torsion cosets, sort of W1 sub Q to WL sub Q or whatever. Okay? So what we want to do is say that these are sort of the same for every point in Q, and therefore they must exist over all of S. Now, the problem with making this argument, this is the issue to deal with in general with these kind of arguments, is what could happen is that for every point in Q, you get sort of different torsion cosets. So they keep moving around on you. Okay, so that's really the kind of thing that, uh, that you have to deal with. And so somehow we need some uniformity statement, which is where this previous F sigma stuff is going to come in. So now take an open disk, sort of delta, in the complex points, see? And so then for all D in delta, we can identify the homology of the specialization to D just with 0 and 2G, we can identify them all in a family at once. But if we're not simply connected with monitoring issues, we have to look at this and there's no monitoring issues. The entire family of identification. And likewise, we can identify the complex points with R mod Z. The 2G. Okay? So then these guys, sort of these T1 to TR, all of these guys specialize to D, pick up torsion cosets. So, so they're elements of sigma. So by what we just showed, there exists a minimal element in F sigma which contains them all. So there is a minimal A in F sigma containing Oh, right? Which means that for every fiber, all your guys contain uh, F sigma. So now we're almost done. Um, 
Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll finish from here next time. Uh, we're almost done. The reason we're not quite done is because these guys that have sigma again aren't complex analytic. If they were complex analytic, you'd conclude that these minimal torsion cosets are just these elements in F sigma. And therefore, you have a sort of at every single point, and so about diversity, you must have it with the entire family at once. But because they aren't complex analytic, you have to do a little bit more work to go from linear subspaces to analytic subspaces. Okay, well, let's do that uh, next time. Thank you. Question? So, uh, so we're not going to meet on, on Friday because it doesn't work with the conference. We'll meet again on Monday. Yeah.